Great. So, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you very much to everybody for, uh, for coming to my talk. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers for the, uh, for the invitation. It's, it's very exciting for me to be here. Uh, this is uh, joint work uh, with Nathan Chong, Tyler Sorensen, and myself. The talk will have four parts. Uh, the first part, explaining what is weak memory. Second part, explaining what are transactions. Third part is explaining how we uh, devised a model that explains how transactions and weak memory work together in uh, x86, Power, ARM, and the C++ language. And the fourth part will be explaining that when you combine transactions and weak memory uh, in the ARM architecture, uh, then there be dragons. OK, so to begin, so weak memory. Um, to explain weak memory, um, I want to show you a tiny little concurrent program. Imagine I have two shared locations, x and y, both initially 0. And I have two threads. On the left-hand thread, I'm putting a 1 into x and then reading from y. And in the right-hand thread, I'm putting a 1 into y and then reading from x. So what can happen when I run this program? Well, to answer that question, you might start trying to imagine all of the possible interleavings that you could have of these four instructions. So one possibility is that x and y, uh, the, the stores happen first and then the loads. And if that happens, then you end up with, oops, if, you, if that happens, you end up with 1, 1 in those two local registers. Another possibility is the left thread finishes before the right, head, the right thread starts. If you get that, then you end up with 0, 1. And if the right-hand thread finishes before the left-hand thread starts, you end up with 1, 0. Now, there are other interleavings of these instructions that you could think about, but they'll all give rise to one of those three outcomes. This interleaving model of concurrency is called sequential consistency, or SC, and it's a nice, simple way to think about concurrent programs. Unfortunately, it's, it's not enough. Uh, because the fact is that uh, if I take this program, which I've written in a sort of x86 style syntax, and I run it on my x86 processor over there, if I run it enough times, maybe 100,000 times, then very occasionally I might see the fourth allowed outcome under x86, which is 0, 0. This is very weird because it can't be explained by any of these interleavings. Uh, and so because it's not a sequentially consistent behavior, we say it is a weak behavior. We say that x86 has a weak memory model. This is very confusing to programmers uh, who are targeting x86, but it's not just a problem with Intel processors. This is something that happens on IBM power processors. It happens on ARM processors, even more so. It happens on GPUs made by NVIDIA and AMD. And because it happens on all of these low-level architectures, it also appears in the high-level languages that we use, like C, C++, OpenCL, Java. They all have some notion of weak memory. It's a completely pervasive concept. And it brings complexity uh, and confusion wherever it appears. Um, so it is an example of a few of the problems. Uh, the x86 weak memory model, that took a couple of goes to get that one right. Um, there were bugs found to do with weak memory in the power processors that were deployed. The C++ specification got a bit confused about exactly what it was guaranteeing with respect to weak memory. Um, compiler optimizations that you'd think would be completely uh, straightforward are in fact invalid in the presence of weak memory. Um, and NVIDIA graphics processors contradicted what their programming guide by NVIDIA said. Um, so it's not just programmers who get confused, it's the manufacturers of these architectures and these, the designers of these languages. Um, so there is a great need, therefore, to be very precise, very formal about exactly what is allowed and exactly what is not allowed in the presence of weak memory. And a lot of work has been done uh, in the last decade or so to pin down exactly what can happen. Um, and the way that these weak memory models are kind of formalized uh, is a bit like this. So you take your um, concurrent program and you enumerate all of the possible um, executions of that program. Uh, so an execution looks a bit like this kind of gadget. It's a, it's a kind of mathematical graph. Uh, you, at the vertices, you have events representing here writes and reads of certain values. They're ordered with edges between the events. You see arrows showing how data flows from one event to another. This is a particular execution that ends up with 1-1. One, one. There are other executions that end up with different outcomes. And the task of the model, then, is to take each of these execution graphs and just answer, is that allowed or not allowed? 
So for sequential consistency, you'd say yes, 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 and no. And for x86, you'd say yes, 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 yes. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk. That's weak memory. The second ingredient is transactional memory. So transactions uh, came around uh, around 1993. Um, and the basic idea is about saying you've got these group, uh, it's, a, it's a mechanism that allows you to put a, a sequence of instructions uh, into a transaction and make it appear that from the point of view of every other thread that these instructions happen all at once or not at all. Um, and then around 2013, transactions really started to hit the mainstream. So they appeared in x86 um, in power with slightly different syntax. Um, while we were doing this project, ARM was developing uh, their own extension uh, of uh, transactional memory for their processors, which uh, in recent months has, has now become uh, publicly announced. Um, and also the C++ committee um, is currently um, working on how to standardize uh, transactions for C++. So in short, it's a really good time uh, to be thinking about uh, the details of how these things should work. Um, so how to combine these two things? It's a bit of a tricky question because on the one hand, we've seen that weak memory is allowing more things to happen. If you go from sequential consistency to x86, you're allowing more outcomes of your program. But if you add transactions, say I put both of these threads inside a transaction now using x86 syntax, what I'm saying here is that the, the two instructions in each thread have to be kept together. So I'm restricting the set of possible interleavings. I'm saying you have to either do this or this. So transactions are restricting the set of outcomes like so. So if weak memory is pulling me in this direction, transactions are pulling me in this direction, what do I get if I combine the two? That's the question we set out to answer. So the main um, intellectual work of the project uh, was taking the existing weak memory models um, from previous authors and working out how to extend them with transactions, which executions should then be forbidden, which should be allowed, and so on. Um, so I won't explain the details of what we did there. I just want to show you kind of visually um, the, the output of that, which was, um, so all the bits that are in a sort of uh, beigey pink are the bits that we added. Okay, so just to show you the magnitude of, 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 of that. Uh, but it's all very well showing you these models. Um, how can you trust me that what we've written down there is, is resembles reality at all? Well, we did five things to try and validate these models. The first thing we did was we looked at the manual, um, which can take you quite far, um, but as is always the case with these uh, informal uh, technical prose documents, um, they're a little bit inconsistent occasionally. Uh, they're certainly a bit incomplete. They don't answer all of your questions. They're sometimes a bit ambiguous. Um, so for any remaining questions, we tried to talk to as many engineers from the various companies that we could do. Um, we also checked that the models we came up with had sort of reasonable mathematical properties. So for instance, you would expect um, that if you have an, a, a behavior that's not allowed and then you add a transaction somewhere, you shouldn't then find that the behavior is now allowed. Okay? So, so tra adding transactions should always be safe, in other words. Um, so we checked that our model models have that property, which they do. Um, we also checked that um, existing compiler mappings, so from C++ down to x86, ARM, power, we know how to compile these, um, uh, this language into these, uh, into these targets. And so we checked that those compiler mappings still work if you add transactions everywhere. But then the fifth and most important way that we validated the models um, was we, we, took the, we took the models and we put them into a constraint solver and we asked the constraint solver, um, if you imagine these are the executions that the model says are not allowed, and then these are the executions that are allowed, we asked for, can you give, can, can you kind of spit out lots of executions that are just at that boundary? So just allow, uh, so just forbidden. Okay, so not sort of really obviously forbidden, but just, just a tiny bit forbidden. Um, and then we took each of those and we turned those into executable tests, and we ran them lots and lots of times on existing hardware which at the time of writing was just x86 and power. And the result of that 
It was this. So on x86, um, this is the size of the tests. This is the number of tests that we automatically generated. And we see that these bars are all green, which means that every test we generated, no matter how many times we ran that test, no matter how many other threads we had sort of pounding the memory system at the same time, we could not observe the behavior that the model said we shouldn't be able to observe, which is good. This suggests that our model is probably sound. And the same story goes for power as well. And then what we also did was we said, um, ask the constraint solver, can you give me um, executions that are just allowed, so just on the other side of that boundary uh, defined by the model? Um, and when we did that, we found, uh, we then tried to run those, and here you want to be able to see as many of these behaviors as possible, um, and we could, we saw most of them. The orange ones are the behaviors we, that the model allows, but we couldn't actually see them. Um, which might mean that our model is a little bit too weak. Um, it may also mean that the machine that we were running on uh, actually cons was a bit conservative. It didn't implement every detail that the architecture allowed it to. It's also possible we just didn't run the enough tests. So we, we came reasonably close in both cases. So our models probably aren't ridiculously weak. Okay, so um, that's how we uh, validated our models. Then the final thing I want to tell you about is how we used uh, our models. So there are many uses you could uh, have of these kind of formal, model, formal uh, models. You could use them to, uh, to validate compilers or, or, or to validate programs that use transactions written in these languages. And um, what we wanted to do was to validate um, a program transformation um, that um, ARM was particularly interested in uh, called lock elision. Uh, this is one of the key uh, driving forces behind having transactional memory at all uh, here. The idea of lock elision is that you have, um, suppose you have a critical region that's protected by a lock. The idea is to elide that lock and replace it instead by having a, the critical section inside a transaction. The benefit of doing this is that if you have two of these critical sections running in parallel and they happen not to conflict, then by having them in transactions, those transactions can go in parallel. If you had them in locks, you'd have to serialize them. Okay. So that's the big win you can get from lock elision. Um, but it, it turns out that uh, the combination of weak memory transactions and lock elision in the ARM architecture is a bit toxic. And uh, here's what can go wrong. So here's a tiny example. I have two critical sections. One is trying to increment x by 2. And the other is just trying to set x to 1. If x starts at 0, you'd hope that you end up either with x is 1 or x is 3 at the end. If you get x is 2, something's gone wrong. Lock elision should work not only when every lock is elided, but also just when some locks are elided. So what I'm going to do is on, uh, I'm going to turn it into ARM syntax first. And then on the left, I'm going to replace that lock with the standard ARM spin lock. You can just copy this from the manual. And on the right, I'm going to use lock elision. So there, I've turned that lock into a, in a uh, start the transaction, finish the transaction. Now, I don't have time to step through all of the, uh, all the instructions, um, but if you see my, uh, my co-author Nathan's talk on YouTube, uh, he will take you through uh, that. Anyway, it turns out that you can now end up with X is 2. So this was a bit of a problem. Um, it's ARM confirmed. Um, and uh, it's a bit of a fiddly one to fix, but they've, they've, they've sorted it out now. Uh, and it turns out that, that this is actually an example that can be generated automatically. So again, using that constraint solver that I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, if you just plug in uh, the definition of what the ARM weak memory model looks like, um, how you extend it with transactions, what lock elision, how lock elision works, um, and how the critical, sec critical sections um, should work, and then you ask it, okay, now give me a counterexample, give it a few minutes, and it, it actually came up with this um, itself. Uh, from which we could generate that sequence of assembly code that I showed you. So that's pretty cool. So in conclusion, weak memory uh, is pervasive. Transactional memory is becoming pretty pervasive too. Um, now is a good time to think about how these two features really interact. Um, and we've done so for several mainstream architectures and languages. And sometimes the interaction can be a bit tricky. Uh, so do be careful. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, do we have any questions? Oh, please go to the microphones, yeah. 
Uh, so very interesting, uh, actually looking at what uh, the architecture actually does. Um, I'm curious, at least for x86, uh, do you think you would have found the aspects of uh, the transactional memory that basically Intel ended up like withdrawing the entire hardware transactional memory support because it was buggy? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what that... I'm trying to remember the. Uh, it was a few years ago. So yeah, yeah, no, I, I remember it was it was tricky. I, d I don't remember that it was ever. I don't know that it was ever made public what the kind of root cause was, and so it's hard for me to say whether we'd have been able to find the same kind of problems. I, I, I don't think it was n known what the, why they retracted it. Okay, so you, so you you did not in fact actually find an issue with the Intel implementation. Correct. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Saurabh Bakshi from Purdue. Uh, so this is regarding the verification of your model. So you showed how there's some behavior that should be allowed and some that definitely should not be allowed. So I was wondering how easy or difficult is it to clearly separate these two spaces? And then you said you picked some test cases which are just close to the boundary of these two. Uh, is that more of an art than in science, picking something like that? Um, <clears throat> so. Uh... Yeah, so we, we try to do it pretty scientifically um, in the sense that um, we, so that the kind of approach was, um, so the, the definition of what is a forbidden behavior is, is defined in, in terms of, uh, of these graph structures, these, these executions. And then we defined um, the, um, you want, you want uh, it's, it's maximally inconsistent is what you want. So, so it, in other words, if you, uh, if you add in any extra synchronization stuff, like add in an extra fence or strengthen uh, some right to a read modifier right or something, so any, anything that sort of strengthens uh, or, or add a transaction or something. So any change you make to that graph tips it over the boundary uh, to become then an, an allowed behavior. Um, so um, so that, that, that was pinned down quite, quite sort of um, objectively, uh, so there wasn't much art there, um, but but I wouldn't claim that it's a sort of comp uh, it's not a complete uh, test generation method. Uh, in, in particular, we only went up to what, six or seven uh, events in these executions, so there may be tests that are bigger than that and that, that would show the model to be unsound, and we we can't be certain beyond that. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you.